Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. We're talking about uh, programming low-level systems using high-level languages, and this is joint work with my two advisors, Matt Welsh and Greg Morissette. Okay, and first of all, I'm going to tell you what the low-level systems I'm going to be talking about are. Okay, so first of all, we have this Tmote Sky device here. It has a 16-bit CPU running at 8 megahertz, 10K of RAM, and 48K of program flash. Okay, so I think we all agree this is a pretty resource-constrained device. Okay. The other device I'm going to be talking about is this Tesla GPU with 448 CUDA cores, running at over 1 gigahertz, okay? Huge amount of memory, huge amount of memory throughput, potentially. But this is still a, a constrained device, and the constraint here is on how we actually program these guys to get them to perform well. If we, for example, don't access memory in a particular way, we're going to get terrible performance. So this first T-Mode Sky, very resource constraints, I think that's obvious from the uh, RAM and, and flash and CPU here that you can see. On the bottom here, the Tesla, this is also a constrained device because of the programming model that we have to use to program this guy. Okay? So the two systems I'm going to be talking about are Flask, first of all, and that's going to be for programming these T-Mote skies, these sensor network nodes. And the second system is Nikola, and that's going to be running on uh, the Tesla GPUs. Okay? I'm going to focus mainly on Flask throughout the talk and talk just a little bit about the end on, on Nikola because it's kind of an evolution of some of the ideas that come from Flask, okay? So... Did you have a slide that, at the end about like one language, about a unified language? Or uh, I'll, I'll talk about, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about the end, yeah, yeah. Okay, so why am I even bothering with high-level languages, right? Well, we're used to using high-level languages on desktop systems, on powerful systems, right? And we're used to things like automatic memory management. This is obviously not something we can do on, for example, these sensor nodes, okay? We'd also like to be able to capture kind of high-level abstractions. And I'm going to argue, I'll show you, uh, I hope I can convince you that high-level languages let us do this in a way that's appropriate for these devices, okay? I also happen to like type languages. So we're going to use types to enforce certain invariants. Um, and we happen to choose the high-level language Haskell. So I'm going to step back for a moment here and, and tell you how I've arrived at this position, okay? So I started out my PhD not as a language person at all, but as a systems person, working on sensor networks. And I'm not gonna talk about the, the old work I did on sensor networks, but it was in programming models for sensor networks, and now there are two NSDI papers that came out of that. And after having written those papers, I took a course on programming languages and become, became kind of enamored with languages because I felt they actually do offer something to systems programmers offer new ways of programming, for example, sensor network nodes um, that are, that are, are you know, not apparent initially because you think, well, how could I possibly use Haskell to program these guys, right? But, but in fact, there are some nice techniques from <coughs> high-level languages that we can apply. I mean, I explain as I go what those techniques are and why they are appropriate, okay? So you can imagine doing this in other languages too. I happen to, to choose Haskell, um, and I'll try to convince you that, that this actually is a good way to write programs. Good plan. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here's a challenge for programming sensor networks. This is a deployment that my advisor Matt Welsh did with some other students. I wasn't involved in this deployment. This was a deployment on an active volcano in Ecuador, Reventador. Okay, real world deployment over a period of 19 days involving 16 sensor nodes. Okay, and I want to point out here that not only are we programming these sensor nodes that have you know 10k of RAM and these terrible tiny processors, but we've got to program collections of these nodes. We've got to get them to communicate and coordinate and do something useful as a group. Okay, so it's doubly challenging. Not only are we programming these tiny devices, but we've got to program lots of them. Okay? And all this stuff was implemented in Nessie, which is kind of a low-level C variant. So you've got to write all this low-level grungy code to program these sensor nodes that are running and collecting data on this volcano. Okay, so the challenge here is can we implement this kind of system in a high-level language? And we actually want it to run on the real devices, right? I don't want to just throw up some Haskell code and say, well, if we could potentially use this code if we were able to run Haskell on these devices. I'm going to actually generate code that runs on real sensor network nodes, okay? So this is the challenge I'm kind of facing. 
So I'm going to step back and just take a kind of a small component and walk through it of this system. This is a very simple seismic monitoring algorithm. It was a piece of the uh, complete system, okay? Just a small piece. And here's kind of the intuitive high-level diagrammatic representation of how this algorithm works, okay? So I'm going to start by sampling some data. This is coming from my seismometer, okay? And this is a single node, okay? I'm going to run a high-gain filter and a low-gain filter. I'm going to compute the ratio between these filters. I'm going to say, is this greater than some threshold? And these constants I figured out from the data before, okay? So I know what these constants are. And if this ratio is greater than a certain threshold, I'm going to say, hey, you know, I saw something. There was some sort of seismic activity. I'm going to report that to some other component that's going to take an appropriate action, okay? Okay, so I'm going to, first of all, program this in Haskell. And the point here is to forget the constraints that we have on the devices that we're actually forced to use in the volcano and say, in an ideal world, how can I program this at a very high level if I didn't have to worry about those constraints? Okay. So I'm going to just happen to use this existing Haskell library that has some nice facilities for doing signal processing in this style. Okay. So let me walk through how I would write this just in pure Haskell. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to write a function to detect. Uh, I've slammed the, the type up here. Don't worry about it too much. If you don't know Haskell, I'll walk through everything. Um, but the idea here is that I'm going to write a signal function. So this operates on signals. And it's going to take doubles, just values from my seismometer that I'm sampling. And it's going to output kind of impulse events that say something happened. Okay? So that's the type of my function detect. And if you like types, I'm going to throw the types of the various combinators I'm using down here at the bottom. Okay? So what do I need to do? Well, I need to take these two high gain filters and implement them. So I'm going to have this, have this functional, this exponentially weighted moving average to compute the, the high gain and low gain filter with my parameters alpha and beta, which I've computed offline somehow. Okay. Then what do I need to do? Well, I need to take these guys and pair them up. Right? So I want to send them down as a pair to the next stage in my pipeline here, the next point in my diagram, the ratio computation. And how do I send this to the next stage? Well, I have another combinator for combining these things and sending this to the next component. Okay. Now I need to compute my ratio. Well, how do I do that? So I need to take a function that computes this ratio and does the threshold test. I'm going to compute that and do the threshold test on individual values that are coming from my high gain and low gain filter. But I need to lift that computation that's operating on just these pairs that are coming out of my filters to the entire stream. Okay? So I have this function here that does the computation point-wise. I need to lift it. And this com combinator here, this our combinator actually lists that pointwise computation so it operates on the streams. That's all that does. Okay? So then I go, again, I need to reuse another combinator to pipe this into the next stage. I'm going to take the values here and pipe them into this box that does the event reporting. And how do I do the event reporting? Well, I actually want to do edge detection on my threshold test. Fortunately, I have a nice combinator for that, edge. And there we go. Okay? So I hope you'll see that the, the boxes here correspond to the code that I've written in a very kind of natural way. And the point here is that this existing Haskell library gives <coughs> us the tools to take this high-level diagram that we have in our heads and map it to actual Haskell code without having to worry a bunch of low-level details. Right? I, imagine writing this in C. Right? There's going to be a lot of low-level stuff that I have to do. And I don't have to do any of that here. I just worry about the kind of the high-level diagram. Right? And it's very natural mapping. So, <clears throat> Here's my detect in Yampa, okay? And I would love to love run this directly on moats, okay? So let me just stick this on a moat. And of course, <laughs> that's not going to work, right? Makes me really unhappy. <laughs> Have to figure out something else that I can do, okay? So let me start by making a few observations about this implementation of my detect function that might give, you, give us some insight into how to, we can possibly run it on actual sensor nodes. Okay. So these combinators that I've used, if you remember from the previous diagram, are just kind of connecting data flow pieces together, moving around, combining them, and piping in, into later stages, right? But these things are all static. They don't change as the program runs, right? They're just defining kind of how the pieces fit together. On the other hand, the portion here that's actually computing this ratio and saying, is it greater than a threshold? 
that's going to run on the nodes themselves because it's actually got to deal with the data, right? So this part is dynamic. The dynamic part is actually dealing with the data, whereas the static part is just dealing with the connections between the various components, right? So the hope here is that we can possibly use Haskell and these nice combinators to talk about this static portion of our program and use something else to talk about this dynamic portion, right? So we might be able to implement this dynamic portion in, in some other language actually on the, on the nodes, but these higher level combinators, they're only going to run once. We only need to know that kind of information once. So we can potentially implement that part in Haskell. So we get the kind of the benefit of using Haskell combinators to piece these components together, but we're still able to generate code that actually runs on real nodes, okay? Yeah, so we want to exploit this split by requiring the programmer to explicitly tell us what stage different pieces of the code are going to run at. So this kind of static stage, you can think of this as compile time, right? So this is going to find a compile time, how I fit together the other pieces of this program. Whereas this dynamic portion is going to run always on the node on, at runtime. Okay? So again, let me show you uh, this detect function in Yampa. And now let me show you the version in Flask that actually runs on real sense humans. There we go. It's pretty similar, right? So the nice thing is that we can actually write this high-level code. We originally wrote it in Haskell, right? Kind of directly mapped this diagram that we had in our heads to code. And we can actually take essentially the same code and run it on sensor nodes, okay? So the idea here is that instead of computing values, my Haskell program is originally computing values, I'm going to now use Haskell in a slightly different way. I'm going to compute programs, okay? So I'm going to take these bits of code down here that are running on the sensor nodes and piece them together using Haskell to generate a binary that actually runs on these devices. And I've used uh, something called quasi-quoting here. So what I've done is I've quoted this language here. I'm calling it red. This is a restricted kind of form of Haskell that doesn't do memory allocation, doesn't allow recursion, so we can implement it efficiently on these devices. But I'd like to write in a nice high level, in, in real program syntax, right? So I've used the quasi-quoting facility here to define this red program fragment, okay? And there are cases where I want to actually splice in values I know in the Haskell code statically compile time into the code that I generate that runs on these nodes. So I'm using anti-quotation here. I'm not going to talk much more about, uh, just one more slide about quotation, anti-quotation. Quotation. This is uh, a facility we added to GHC. Um, that's a Haskell workshop paper. Okay, so again, as I said, I'm computing program fragments rather than values. That's the, the kind of the trick I play to get this thing to work. So instead of writing quasi those red fragments using quasi-quoting, I could have just written abstract syntax. So I've done that here just to show you what this expands to. Um, so here's my original quotation. Here's my anti-quotation. So I can write these program fragments directly, but instead I have a nice syntax for doing that. Okay. And this por portion here, of course, this program fragment is what is actually going to run on these sensor nodes. Okay. So... This question here. Sorry. So your very first thing you have, uh, where you pair together the moving averages, you use an actual lambda saying that's that's a static that's a static Haskell function, right? Yes, yes. So I'm taking a, a signal in, and then the EW, EWMA functions know how to generate code to take that signal, which is kind of an abstract representation of something that actually runs on the node, and hook it up appropriately so that it pairs together those EWMAs using this pair kind of thing. And then I generate some code with this combinator that takes this guy and hooks it up to this map. And you can imagine that map, well, it has this function that needs to apply to each value it sees. So it's going to generate some nesty code from this guy and also generate the glue code that applies to everything coming in on the input stream and then sticks it on the output stream to go to the next stage. Yeah. Other questions? What is Haskell? So fresh is going to be computation, right? So, well... Ah, well, then you're going to diverge when you actually generate the code, yeah. So the idea here is that thresh is just a double. It's just a constant that I'm passing into my detect, right? 
So the idea here is that the, the low gain, the alpha and the beta and the threshold are just constants that I'm passing in to generate this code. Right? So if these guys diverge, they're going to diverge at compile time when I generate the code. Right? There's no divergence then on the node because you don't even get to that stage. Okay? So should I think of an S of T, as a S of type tau as being a, a, uh, uh, a program which when you run it would produce a value of type tau? Uh, you can think of that as a signal stream, a stream of values of type tau that exists on the nodes. So I'll talk about the, the types and how that works a little bit more. Now it's going to work because we've lost. We had, previously we had signal functions. So yes. Made sure we plan that. Now we only have one type parameter. Wait, now, so. now we only have signals, not signal functions. Yeah. Right. And so, so where did that go? So, <laughs> so uh, why are we using signal functions in Yampa, for example? Let me, let me start there. Why do they use signal functions? That's because, uh, so why don't they use the Haskell function space instead of arrows, right? And that's because they need a, to get a handle on the kind of the internal form of these functions to, for example, do some optimization or to avoid space leaks, things like that, right? So they can't just use the general Haskell arrow type. They need to use signal functions. Now, why are we getting away with using just Haskell arrows here? Well, because we already have a representation of the code. We already have abstract syntax that we're generating. So we already have a handle, a kind of an intentional way of talking about this stuff. So I threw out the... the the signal function stuff and went straight with signals. Does that, does that answer the question? So instead of SFAB, you have A arrow SB. I'll have S A arrow SB. Oh. Yeah. Oh, 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 right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. So that's it, just, you know, why don't we use Haskell arrows to write the YAMPA stuff? That's because we need some sort of intentional representation that we can get our hands on and manipulate. Uh, the other thing I want to, how do you, EWMA? EWMA. Did what you does write he, that in the same language, or is that some kind of magical th thing? There, there's another. I can, I can show you the code if you want later on. Um, but in general. In general, so there are some combinators for doing things like keeping doing stateful computations, so you can keep some state and update it over time. So that's what EWMA will use. There's one combinator that lets you initialize state and update it with incoming values on your stream, and output a new state and a new value, right? So I can use that combinator, which is baked in, to implement things like EWMA. So this is a relatively small amount of code, the actual implementation, that relies on this kind of integration. But you have a fixed number of baked in combinators. Yes. And then yeah. EWMA is just another function written in this Absolutely. language over the, OK. Absolutely. Another question? Do you restrict the types that you can emit from S? Absolutely. I'm going to talk about that shortly. Yeah, that's, that's key. OK, so what is Flask? Well, Flask offers kind of this high-level streaming combinator library, similar to Yampa, but targeted towards sensor network nodes. Okay? We use Haskell as the language, as the meta-language, to glue these program fragments that we're running on individual sensor nodes together. And we provide two languages to actually write program fragments that run on the sensor nodes. First of all, Red, which I've shown you already, and it's just, as I said, a restricted form of Haskell that we can actually compile efficiently down to sensor nodes. And the other language is Nessie, which is the language that people typically program this kind of device in. And that's so we can interface with legacy code, for example. Okay? Um, so the pipeline here that I've been talking about is we take this kind of Haskell and Flask code, we're going to generate some kind of intermediate form for the red code, for example. And this intermediate form also describes how these combinators build up this streaming data graph. And we're going to convert that down to Nessie, translate it to Nessie. We have a runtime that's also written in Nessie. Take these two together, slam them through the Nessie compiler to actually generate a binary. Okay, and that, mo that binary actually is what we push, push onto devices. Right? So this, when I was talking about static, this is all the static stuff, right? This is all kind of compile time. But we're running a Haskell program at compile time, a Haskell program to generate code that we then compile, that we then stick on the, on the moat, and that compiled code that we put on the moat is what actually runs and implements our program. So I, I didn't quite get the answer to Claudia's question about the divergence of the, the parameter on a couple of slides back. Could you uh, Okay, yeah, so the question was... What if Thresh diverges? What, is, what if Thresh diverges? Okay, so the Haskell code is run at compile time, right? So if Thresh diverges, then when you compile the program, the compilation process will diverge. 
right? And so you won't actually get <coughs> a binary out of, out of your program. But the divergence happens before you actually run anything on the device, okay? So it's compile time divergence. Does that, does that yeah, make it okay. clear? Other question? Yes, yeah, so I mean, Haskell is lazy everywhere, so that's maybe the cause of you know, this problem with Thresh. So would it, would it make sense to have core value language with limited laziness? You, I guess you need laziness for the streams. Well, so the streams are purely runtime things, okay. right? So they only happen at runtime. We're not really using, we're not using laziness at all when we're running the actual code. Now, we may use laziness when we generate the code, you could argue. Uh, is it, well, okay, yeah, sure, sure. I think it's core by value. I mean, I could say ideally in any situation I'd like a strongly normalizing language, right? I mean, we might agree on that, but. Do you ever want to generate infinite programs? Infinite programs. See, we've cooked in, we've baked in the combinators in such a way that if you take these limited fragments and only use our combinators to combine them, you get resource-bounded programs. Now, you could generate too much code to fit on the device, or you could use too much memory, but those are the only problems that you can oh, look, you, know. you, put, you replace edge in the bottom line with detect low high thresh. That's what I'm uh, yeah, okay. An yeah, yeah. No, okay, you'll get an infinite program at compile time. Exactly. Yeah, 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 but you won't actually, yeah. yeah. So again, you'll diverge at compile time, not at actual <laughs> runtime. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, so you seem to be telling me uh, what a wonderful idea it is to write compilers in Haskell. <laughs> hooray, hooray! How does my message disappear from that rather oversimplified explanation of it? Uh, so, the, the question is is my message here just that Haskell is a great way to write compilers? Or if I use a different language? Uh, part of the message, anyway. uh, well, I, you know. Uh, what have I added to Haskell? What more have you added to the message? Why don't I just write my compiler in Haskell? Uh, well, I can imagine using a different language to do this similar kind of construction, right? The message here is that what I'm really using Haskell to do is define these combinators that allow me to easily translate this high-level description, kind of di diagrammatic idea of what my algorithm is down into code. Could you do this in a different language? Possibly yes. No, no. Let's use a functional language to write compilers. That's your general message. Well, uh, no, that's not really my general message. My general message is that we can, using this particular functional language, we can write... Because it has to, it's not arbitrary. Well, I... You don't like compilers like this. Right. It's... I mean, I could, I could choose a different language. Haskell is nice, a nice instance for doing this. Is there anything special about Haskell that makes this easy? Uh, there are in some cases, and I'll talk about some of the typing stuff and type classes that let me constrain the type of code that actually can run on these devices. Okay. Now that would be something. Okay, you. okay. In a sense, you're, you're avoiding writing a compiler by seeing how far can you go with right, using right. an existing language. Embedding a specific language, which is, as Simon said, called by value language. Yeah, it's yeah. And using Haskell to piece it together. Right, right. I mean, there is a little bit of compilation that goes in here because I'm compiling red down to Nessie. But you can imagine taking away red at all and just writing Nessie, right? And then I'm not really compiling any language at all, I'm just translating. But, uh, other question? Very quickly going back to Simon's question. So, so, so if, if I wanted to write a. Um, a data flow that has some feedback loop, is it, do you provide a combinator? To yes, or not, or not? There's a, so there's an integration. So EWMA, for example, has some feedback, right? Because it's going to keep some state and update that state with values that come in. Because, 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 because just putting detect instead of edge, just putting detect, something that doesn't work. That doesn't, that doesn't work, right? That's going to diverge. But there's something else that you have that works. Yeah, yeah. So you can think of, uh, if you're familiar with, with arrows, you can think of like the loop combinator <coughs> in arrows. Right, so that you, you control the way that, that the, the, the fixed point is generated, right? So, yeah, so there are some combinators baked in that let you do those looping constructs, but they're baked in in such a way that you can be sure that they're resource limited and bounded, right? So, can I ask you uh, the comparison of using Haskell with, say, the theorem proving, uh, theorem provers as the metaprogramming environments? How do you compare it to the long kind of tradition of work of doing hardware description languages in? theorem provers or all other sorts of 
kind of embedded languages in those metaprogramming frameworks? Embedded languages in, say... Oh, it's like Kalk or Hall or Isabel. Yeah, um, so Greg, Greg, my advisor, said, oh, you should really do this in Kalk, for example, because he's a Kalk fan. Mm -hmm. You could do something like this in Kalk. Um, when I talked about, about Nicola, I think it may, may be more apparent. So this particular in Flask, we're just kind of generating code and then running on the device, right? But what I'd really like to do is be able to write a program that runs in the CPU that communicates with the moats, right? So I'm writing one program, part of it runs in the CPU, part of it runs in the device, and there's an interplay between the two. Could you do that in Coq? Maybe. Uh, I, I would argue it's actually easier to do in Haskell. Um, it's a bit easier to write those Coq kinds of stronger type classes. You could, uh, you could avoid the, uh, all the metaprogramming because type, Coq type classes are powerful enough to do that. Yeah, yeah. Haskell. Yeah. Or, yeah. Uh, so it's merely, merely, it's merely a practical issue, right? So you could imagine doing a lot of this in a, in a, in a language like Coq. But from a practical standpoint of view, You've chosen Haskell. May I suggest an answer to my own question? <laughs> <laughs> if you're using the type system of Haskell mm -hmm. to guarantee at least some aspects of the correctness of the compiler that you write, yes. you only compile things that fit together at the edges. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. So you see the properties of the property of the various properties and laws of the AB that you can prove. Yeah, yeah. So I'll talk about the, the typing, how the typing traits come in and, and guarantee that the stuff that we write can actually run on these devices in, in a few slides. Good question? So can you split code to run differently on different modes? And is there any primitives for communicating with you? Yes, and I'll, I'll talk about how you can program the network as a whole versus individual devices. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, so here's where I get to talking about the types, okay? So my types here, um, so I just have types for this kind of red embedded language, expressions and red types. This type S of A, um, so given a signal carrying values of type alpha that runs on my node, I'm going to have S of this kind of Oxford bracket of alpha. This is the Haskell type that corresponds to my alpha running on the node or corresponds to my red type. Right? So an S of alpha is going to be a stream of, of values that runs on the sensor node. Okay? So this guy runs on the sensor node. Node level code, similarly, is going to have this type N. So whenever you see the N, you think that's code that runs on the node with this type. Okay? And whenever you see the S, you can think this is a stream of values with this type that exists on the sensor node. So we use this Haskell type as a phantom type parameter, and that's how we enforce the typing uh, on our combinators. Okay? So here are the combinators, for example. So map. So you look at the type here, and you can say, okay, this is code that runs on the node. It's a function of type A to B. Okay? That's the function I'm going to do the actual, that's the actual function I'm going to map over the stream. I'm going to have an S of A. That's my input stream carrying values of type A. I have this output stream carrying values of type B. Filter, similar. And these are combinators for taking streams and combining them, splitting them apart, uh, merging them, so on and so forth. OK? What's, what's a node, just to be precise? What, what, what do you mean by node? What is a node? Is, it, is it that individual T-mode sky right. that I showed you initially. Right. So that is a node in the sensor network, sensor network node. Okay, so how do we ensure well-typed terms? Well, what we need to do is constrain the Haskell types that can actually appear in node code. Okay, so we're going to do that using type classes in Haskell. So for example, I'm going to have this function reify that gives me, takes a Haskell type, this type class that takes a Haskell type and gives me a red type back. And I'm only going to write instances that allow me to convert good Haskell types into red types. So for example, I can take integers. I can certainly have integers on my nodes. I can take tuples and certainly do that. So the constraint here says that if I can put an A, type A, on the node and a type B, I can put pairs of A and B on the node. Of course, there are some types that I don't want to allow. For example, lists. So it is not the case that if I can put, use an A in node code, 
that can use a list of A's, right? That's just disallowed, and we disallow that by not writing an instance in that case. And the, the uh, type class definition is squirreled away and hidden so that you can't write instances yourself. That's there, the, the user sees I'm not compiling a program because there's no instance for this. Exactly. You, you can't write the instance yourself, so if I don't provide you with an instance, you can't write code with that type. Right? And the way we enforce this okay, is using this lift type class. And the idea here is that we want to take this ADA, which is code in some form, we're going to do it for red or nest C, and convert it to code that runs on a node. Right? So you can think of this as I'm either writing nest C, giving you a nest C abstract syntax here, or red abstract syntax. And I want to perform some operation on it that lifts it so that it can actually run on the node and wraps it in this type. That means I can pass it to my combinators. So here's the instance for red code. It says red abstract syntax is an expression. So if I can reify A, that just says if A is a Haskell type that I can implement on this hardware, then I can lift a red expression onto, into node code, code that actually runs in the node, as long as I can type check this expression at this type tau, which is the reification of the Haskell type. So I'm reifying the Haskell type. I'm taking the Haskell type, converting it to a red type, and I can only do that for types that I've written an instance, if I've written the instance, right? So I know that I can implement that on the node. So that's what this tau is. I'm taking my Haskell type, converting it to a red type, and I'm just performing this type checking, okay? And this type checking is going to run at code generation time. Um, now, the nice thing is that, you know, it's, it's true that I'm not statically checking this necessarily at compile time, because you can imagine that if I don't actually generate some code for some portion of the program on Tuesdays, that doesn't type check, that's okay, right? But on Monday, if I actually do generate that code, I happen to use that code path, and this type checking function is called, it, it will go wrong, and I'll get some error, right? So that's not, not such a great property, but on the other hand, um, I'm, I am able to connect the type checking errors when they occur back to the original source code locations, because when I've generated the, the red uh, we've written these red quotations in line. I have source code locations attached to them instead of pushing off the type checking to, for example, the generated nest C code, right? So that's another alternative. I could have just generated nest C code and allowed the, C com the nest C compiler to give me type errors, but instead I'm, I'm at least doing some typing checking here so I can, I can give you good error messages in the cases where this fails. So can you, can you encode the, um, the, the typing into the X part as a uh, yeah, no, I could have, I could have used GAT, ADTs to do a lot of this. Yeah, I just happened to, to yeah. choose type classes. So you can do this with GADTs. Yeah, absolutely. Just a small question about the previous slide. So when, when you were allowing pairing, but mm -hmm. previously you said you, know, you have some restrictions on allocation. Yeah, well, so this is not a recursive type. I can always say pair integers. That doesn't require any allocation. Um, I mean, everything's unboxed here, if that, if that helps. Okay. Right, so pairs are okay. I can build bid pairs, um, but I don't want to build lists because that's a recursive data type and that will require allocation. Right, so pairs are okay, lists are not okay. Okay, so what about this volcano thing that I've told you about? Okay, so we actually re implemented the code that was deployed on Reventador using the Flask system. Um, this is a, we tried to be as faithful as possible to the original implementation. And we actually did smoke test this on MoatLab, which is a test bed running real sensor node hardware, about 160 nodes. Um, I'm going to show you benchmarks for some other programs in a moment. Um, but this did, did run, didn't benchmark it. Um, and here are just kind of the comparison of the lines of code required for the logic in the main part of the program. This is our Flask implementation compared to the Nestle implementation. So you know, why, why is it so much smaller? It's because we can use the kind of combinators that I showed you earlier in the detect example. I can write these high-level combinators and use them to very concisely specify the operation of my program. So that's really where the, where the gain comes from here. What about the size of the generated code? That, that's the next slide. Okay. <laughs> so here's the size of the generated code. Um, we're kind of in the same ballpark as original implementation. Now, I'll note that we did remove some extraneous features 
from both systems, um, when those were thrown back in, you actually hit the ROM limit, the program text limit of these devices, right? So um, but these, are, these are pretty big programs. The, po the point is this is a big program for a sensor node, right? Because it actually takes up all of ROM, right? But, so why is the program so big? In, why? in SC to start with. I mean, the program didn't seem to be doing anything specific. It, it does a few inequalities and then... So that was a very small component of actually what, what's oh, going okay. on. Right, right. So yeah, this is, yeah. So, there's a, so, so for example, that very small component, if it says, I've detected something, it sends a signal off to the base station. The base station says, OK, let me read the last 60 seconds of data from you. So you have to deal. That message comes back. You have to process that. You have to maintain a history of your signal, so et cetera. So to clarify this, so your, your flash comparison, you actually recoded the whole thing. I recoded the whole thing, right. There are a few pieces that I de did leave out. So for example, Deluge is a component that lets you reprogram the devices on the fly. That's external. That wasn't really germane, so I just tossed it. Right. But, but otherwise, the main program logic, we really tried to implement faithfully what was going on. Uh, there are a few things that we took out. Okay. So we have some protocol kind of like this Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you'll see that the communication cost here, the commu communication component is really much larger for Flask than for Nessie. And the problem was, when I wrote Flask, I wrote a, ran or wrote a runtime that included a kind of general communication layer for lots of different possible patterns of communication. So we'd not only do the kind of spanning tree, but also a multicast, things like that. It was not tailored to this application. So instead of rewriting the routing protocol tailored to this application, which I thought was slightly dishonest, I just reuse the existing Flask runtime. And the, and the question really was, if I use Flask as it exists, right, how hard is it to rewrite this deployed system right, using the included combinators and uh, runtime? Right. But particularly for this application, you'd want something like the routing library to be componentized so that if you don't need the spanning tree, it doesn't get put into the Yep, ab absolutely. And you can, you can, so there are some combinators for this particular routing implementation that I've provided. You can write other combinators that give you other routing primitives. Yeah. So you can swap those out. Now that does require writing new combinators to glue to existing Nessie routing protocol. So you could certainly do that. And you could swap out this component. In fact, I could have swapped it out and written new combinators for the existing routing protocol in the deployed system, but I didn't do that. Okay? Okay, so I've told you how to program individual nodes. I've said, well, I can actually program these whole collections of devices. So let, let me... Question. So, that, but the total... <coughs> is the same. So why is the application um, smaller? Like, what optimizations is it doing that so there's actually a lot of reusable code in the Nessy components <coughs> that's just duplicated, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's kind of messy code. Mm -hmm. So we were able to abstract away some of the common patterns that existed even within this Nessy <coughs> implementation, and that's why the code kind of is smaller, right? So I mean, I spent a lot of time trying to find those patterns. Right, and it, it did pay off. Now, I'm not going to say, you know, you, you look at the lines of code here, it's not much code, but the amount of effort that went into writing that code, <laughs> as with all of Haskell, you know, any Haskell program you write, a small amount of code, but the amount of effort that goes into it <laughs> is tremendous. So, but, but, I, but, but the hope is, of course, after you've written the code, if you give that code to someone else, it's much easier for them to understand, right? So you're putting effort not just into writing the code, but you're putting that effort into the code as a gift to others who have to read your code in the future, okay? So it's an investment in the future. Question in the back? The one thing I noticed from this slide is that um, you've reduced the number of the main program logic nestled codes, but you've almost effectively pushed that into the Flask wrappers. It's almost a similar number of extra lines of code in the Flask wrappers. So, so that's, that's fair. Um, so the argument that I'll make here for this kind of these Flask wrappers are these are actually reusable 
nasty yeah. components, right? So I can reuse samples of the data store, the flash stores, and the sampling over many programs. So these are nice combinators that don't apply just to this particular program, but apply in general. So you're, you're right. When I have to write these reusable components that interface with existing Nessie code, there's some extra effort that goes into that. Yeah. But, but at least they're reusable. So I guess a fair comparison would be to say, what if you actually write a nice Nessie library that allows you to do a lot of these things? Yes. And then, sure, there is some glue code that looks ugly in C because Haskell is the epitome of beauty. <laughs> but, you know, you still have this reusable code that then will reduce probably your lines of code right. in the messy program. Right, right, absolutely. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you how to program the network, okay? And this is, I've told you, given you this simple detect function that operates on individual nodes, but really I want to program the network as a whole. And, and can I do that in a high-level way, right? So... This infold combinator, it's kind of a network fold. And the idea here is that I'm going to collect data both locally and from other nodes and combine it, aggregate it, and provide a single stream of data at the end for the entire network. Okay. So again, for fans of types, here's some types at the bottom. But let, me, let me walk through this um, and how it actually operates. Okay, so here's my collection of nodes. I'm going to form a spanning tree here. Okay. And then what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to read some temperature. So this my example here is I'm going to kind of compute average temperature over the whole network. So I'm going to locally sample the temperature sensor here. And this is my signal in that I'm going to pass to my network fold. Okay? So these are local readings. Okay? And so this guy has type SA. So these are just a stream of values of type A that exists on the nodes. Right? Okay? So I'm also going to receive on a particular channel, radio channel, from other nodes. I'm just going to read those values from whoever happens to send them to me. And then that produces a string. And I'm going to combine those guys with merge. Then what do I need to do? Well, this loop combinator, this is kind of the stateful combinator that I was talking about earlier, right? So I'm going to collect these values. I'm going to have some Q depth, this maximum Q depth and some timeout. So the idea here is that if I have too many values, I'm going to go ahead and combine them, push them up. And also, if I reach a timeout but I haven't filled my buffer, I'm going to go ahead and combine things and push them up. So I'm periodically combining these values that I've received both locally and from other nodes in the network and pushing them out onto an output string and sending them up the spanning tree. Okay? So this kind of high-level network fold combinator lets me easily express aggregating values over the entire network. Okay, and that's kind of the idea here. So not only can I program individual nodes here, but I can program the network as a whole, writing these high-level combinators. Right? And this is actually a, a combinator that I can write and use in Flask. And so I did use this. Uh, for various reasons, implemented a small SQL-like language compiler. It was about 200 lines of code. And, and the point there is that it's relatively easy to implement these systems if you have all these nice combinators to begin with. And really, most of that 200 lines was parsing SQL, sadly. Okay? So here's a simple query I'm going to run. This is just the average temperature kind of query that I was showing you before. This is actually running on MoteLab, um, which is, consists of uh, 160 nodes. At this point in time, it's about 160 nodes. Same T-Mode Sky devices I was showing you before. This is all implemented in Flask running on the real devices. This is the temperature query running over a three-hour period in the morning. Uh, you can see that as the uh, sun rises, the temperature of the building increases. Right? You can see the AC kick on and uh, the temperature go down. And what I did is I instrumented this system so that the nodes would send their individual sensor readings over a serial port. So I collect all that data and kind of ground truth the query answer that came out the top of the, of the tree. So here I've just compared the, the ground truth, which is I've actually collected the real data from each node to calculate this line here in red, the solid line, and then the dotted blue line, the dashed blue line here, is actually the query result that I got out. So the point here is that I can build this real system. This is running not just on 16 nodes, like the volcano example, right? This is running on 160 nodes. So in fact, there are 157 nodes that reported. Some of them were in the far reaches of the building, weren't able to connect. But almost all the nodes actually got data 
that shows up in this graph, right? So I can build a real system in Flask. And that's the point here. Question? Yeah, so you said that uh, you're building a spending tree. Mm -hmm. um, and you also say that some of the nodes can fail to communicate. Mm -hmm. So is this, do they do anything to, if like some, some node of the spending tree stops communicating, do they try to like find the new spending tree? Yes, yes. And that's part of the runtime under the covers. And that's one reason why that, there was so much code there, because it does try to refill the spanning tree. And also it does not just spanning trees, but multicast, stuff like that. So yeah, it does. But that's but in that's, Flask too. That's not in Flask. No, no. no. That, that runtime is written in Nessie. Okay. Right, right, right. What's the yield? What's the yield? Uh, this is the uh, fraction of nodes reporting over time, right? So we, we get at least 80% of the nodes reporting in any given time slot here. Right. So that, that's, that's always, yeah. Okay. So just, just kind of summarize. I hope I've convinced you that Haskell lets us build these kind of nice high-level abstractions that define how this kind of these data flow components fit together, right? So the Flask library provides these nice combinators for managing state, uh, you know, kind of interfacing with Nessie, interfacing with legacy code. Um, the same kind of combinators that we saw in Yampa, the pure Haskell library, but we get to actually use them on sensor nodes, okay? And of course, we can write new combinators like Enfold from the existing combinators, right? Enfold is not a built-in primitive. I build that network fold of the existing primitives, but it's still reusable, right? It's still a reusable abstraction, but it's not primitive, okay? Um, so we can provide kind of this syntactic and typing support both for Red and Nessie, these embedded languages that run the nodes, and of course, we can interface to legacy code. Okay. So just a brief interlude before I talk about Nicola very quickly. So this kind of quasi-quoting stuff, it was nice for running code on the nodes, but what I really like to be able to do is run Haskell code directly. I don't have to change my code at all. Okay. Also, Flask is staged. I kind of mentioned this earlier, right? Flask is staged. I run the program, generate some code, run the node. But I'd really like to run these things simultaneously. Right? I'd really like my Haskell code to interact with my, off device, my other device, right? So the question here is kind of how far can we go towards fully integrating these off-CPU devices with Haskell, right? I, I want a homogenous programming environment as close to it as I can get for a heterogeneous system, okay? So Nicola, I'm going to embed compiled GPU functions in Haskell. So these GPUs, of course, are these massively parallel SIMD processors. They have very specific restrictions on code structure, how you use memory. For example, you can't have recursive functions that run on these devices. And typically, again, as these nodes were pro these sensor nodes were programmed in this kind of low-level Nessy language, well, you've got to program GPU kernels in CUDA or OpenCL, kind of low-level C code again. Okay? We'd like to get away from that. Okay? So how can we really utilize these GPUs from a high-level language, just as we wanted to utilize sensor nodes from a high-level language? Okay. So my goals here are, I, I want to call these GPU kernels from Haskell. right? So I want to be able to call into the GPU from my Haskell code. I'd like to be able to write the kernels in Haskell, or as close to that as I can get. So I want to minimize the syntactic overhead. Right? I don't want to have to change my code to get it to run on the GPUs. Although I do want the programmer to be able to access low-level code if needed. Right? Just like on the moats, there are cases where you need to interface with Nessie. In this case, I may want to interface with CUDA code. So I'm going to allow that. And I'd also like to compile my GPU kernels at Haskell compile time. Right? So I'd actually like to compile my kernels at the same time I compile my CPU code. And of course, uh, because the rest of this stuff is really easy, um, I'm going to throw one more thing in here. Right? I want to avoid mo modifying the compiler when I do any of this stuff. So let me show you as a, as a running example this Black-Scholes uh, computation. And the reason I chose this is the NVIDIA guys like this. It's in the SDK, so we can do a nice comparison. And they like this, I guess, because they sell a lot of this hardware to, to financial firms. Uh, and and Satin was telling me he used this Black-Scholes implementation in a blog post and gets all these emails from financial guys, too. So I, you know, so, someone likes it. I mean, so it's a good example, right? OK. So here's my Haskell example, pure Haskell. OK. Or rather, this is just, just running on the CPU, pure CPU code. I'm using some Haskell libraries here. What does the performance look like? Okay, this is a log log graph of the performance, um, number of options here on the bottom, and the time here on the y axis. 
So if I actually run this example as exists in the CUDA SDK, you can see I much, get much better performance, right? So this is the comparison of CPU code versus GPU code, right? So what I really would like to do is write the code that corresponds to this line, the triangles here, but get the performance that corresponds to my squares, okay? Now, of course, there are a bunch of constraints I have to satisfy when I'm writing these programs, right? So, as I said, recursion is not allowed. Of course, function pointers are not allowed in CUDA either. So, the memory used by CUDA kernels has to be pre-allocated. Now, this restriction has been relaxed a little bit in recent SDKs, but still, before I call a kernel, I have to allocate GPU memory for the data that I'm passing to the kernel, and I have to allocate memory for the GPU memory to GPU to write into to pass back to me as a result. So I do this kind of static allocation before I actually call into the kernel. Of course, I have to explicitly manage the transfer of data back and forth. Um, so I have to do something in Nicola to restrict it in such a way, just as I've restricted the code that ran the vices on, on the sensor nodes, to restrict Nicola so that I can compile efficiently down to GPUs. Okay? So let me show you quickly, again, the Haskell version of Black Scholes. And here is the Nicola version. Here are the changes. Mostly it's just type signature changes. Um, so I have to rewrite my conditional here for various messy Haskell reasons. I can get, get rid of that at, uh, using the rebindable syntax feature in GHC7. I throw in this vapply. I'm not going to talk too much about the reasons here. I don't have time to get into why we've done this. But the point is that this is fairly lightweight syntactically. And in fact, I could probably get rid of most of these type signatures and not write any type signature and get the same code to run on the GPU as the CPU, right? So here's my original performance graph. Here's my Nikola performance, right? So I've written essentially the Haskell code that I originally wrote, but I've gotten the GPU performance, okay? Uh, do I have the CUDA code? I don't have it on this slide. I could show you the generated CUDA code if you like, but yeah. So a bunch of problems that I've described in the paper I don't have time to get into. Right, so there's code explosion. I've got to statically infer the memory size that I'm allocating on these devices. I've got to compile loops. I've got to manage the marshalling. I need to compile, as I said, remember I wanted to compile Nicola at Haskell compile time, where there's some tricks to use template Haskell to do that. And of course, I need to embed plain old CUDA code. I don't have time to get into all that. But, but the point overall for the entire talk is that you know, Haskell allows us to write these nice, concise programs using these kind of reusable high-level abstractions. And that's great for Haskell programs, but how do I use that to write programs that run on these off-CPU devices, these constrained devices, right? So by carving out kind of language fragments that we can compile efficiently on these devices, we can still use Haskell to piece together these components in a useful way. So we still kind of get some of the benefit of Haskell, but we still can actually write code that runs on these devices, right? And in certain domains, cost here, in terms of cycles, memory, et cetera, is minimal. Okay, so let me just talk very briefly about future work. Okay, the first idea is Nicola, Nicola on a NIC. So we have these nice net FPGA, you know, now there are these 10 giggy cards. So I'd like to be able to take the same ideas from Nicola, right, this kind of GPU, CPU split, but I can still communicate between these GPU and CPU programs, and apply that here to FPGAs to do, for example, network processing, right? So this is kind of a nice natural evolution of the Nikola work, right? On the other hand, uh, stepping back, I mean, I think we really need better support, both in terms of languages and runtime for this kind of heterogeneous computing uh, environment. I think this is really where computing is moving towards these kind of heterogeneous devices. Of course, GPUs, we've seen that explosion. We have FPGAs potentially coming into the mix. But how do we do things like you know, teaching the garbage collector to manage off-device memory uh, and to intelligently transfer things back and forth? We need to be able to automatically partition our programs across these devices. And of course, instead of rewriting our code for every possible device, so I write CUDA on an NVIDIA card, maybe I'm going to write OpenCL on the ATI card, uh, sorry, AMD card, because uh, I don't trust NVIDIA's OpenCL mutation. I'm going to write Verilog for FPGAs. I'd really like to write that program once at a high level and be able to switch devices down below. Right? Okay. So uh, here are some references for some things I mentioned earlier. Uh, and otherwise, that's, that's in my talk. Please take more questions. <laughs>